Hey everyone, welcome to episode 7 of Sales Enabled, where I'm going to be speaking once again with Andrea Abate. Andrea is a global sales enablement leader, trainer, and public speaker with over 20 years of corporate experience across US, EMEA, and APAC. Currently, Andrea is the Vice President of Revenue Enablement at Showpad and is one of the Sales Enablement Collective's 2023 Ones to Watch top sales enablers globally. In this episode, we discuss the idea that Andrea has coined the sales paradox, the concept that the expectation from training enablement is often more than the allocated time and resource sales leadership are willing to invest. If you work in sales training or enablement, you'll recognize the situation well, and there are some great tips on how to deal with the scenario. If you work in sales or sales leadership, this is an essential listen to help you get the best out of your enablement team, as well as how to view the time it takes to develop a sales professional. Let's get into the conversation. Hey, Andrea, great to see you again. Feels like such a long time since we we last caught up. Um, But we're going to be covering a a slightly different topic today. And, you know, I remember I saw you at an event actually in Birmingham and you're speaking on uh, this sales training, sales enablement event. Um, And one of the things you talked about was this interesting concept of sales paradox, right? Which is, and, you know, I've faced it as a sales trainer uh, for a long time with managers saying, hey, you know, my team are terrible at this. I'm like, okay, well, great. So let's train them. And I'm like, whoa, 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 no, I can't take them off the floor. Like, you need to improve them immediately, like it's the matrix. Um, and we can plug something into the head. And I like the way you called it this sales paradox, right? Is that we want to develop people, but we don't have the time. And I know that, you know, this is a challenge. And, and you, you eloquently, artfully uh, put it into better words than I could. So, you know, hey, good to have you back again. But yeah, help, help me out. How do you define sales paradox? How have you seen it uh, come up in your line of work? Oh, it's a great question, Dan. And thanks for having me back. And um, yeah, I don't know if this is like an official term or just something I created. So maybe it's official now. But yeah, so a paradox is l- defined as an unreconcilable riddle. You know, like the frog jumping. Like there is a line of thought to say that from for a frog to jump from here to here, you could arguably never get there because no matter how close he gets, it's half the distance from where he was before. So even if you're touching the yeah. thing, maybe there's microscopic areas of space in between the frog's toe and that wall. So point is, is that the word paradox suggests that there is no answer because unless something radically changes and I've been in sales and enablement for 20 years, this has never changed. And speaking to my mom, this has never changed. And in speaking to people who are in their first job in the workforce, this doesn't seem to be changing, which is two irreconcilable truths. The first is that there are still 24 hours in a day. Okay. So time is a binary, unchangeable factor. But the second. Anyone knows 86, was it 86,400 minutes, something like that? 525,600 minutes in a year, because I listened to rent a lot as a teenager. Um, (laughs) So that is the fact on which the sales paradox exists, which again, you're listening to this podcast for a solution. I'm telling you, there is no solution. There's just workarounds, <laughs> which is every salesperson and sales leader that you ask wants to be the best. They want to succeed. They want to smash quota. They want to make money. They want every tool, skill, edge, piece of information available to them to do that. So we as enablers in our capes, in our superhero costumes, come cruising in and saying, great, all that stuff and training and this that you asked for, that you told us you want, that you are not only desperate for, you're willing to put headcount and budget and thinking time to, we have this for you. We have this amazing training or this kick-ass playbook or this fantastic course or whatever the solution to the problem you said you desperately want to solve. And then salespeople everywhere, sales leaders everywhere have one reaction. Ugh, do we really have to fucking do this? <laughs> right? It's like and round and round it poisonous. goes. Like just, well, I, you know, I need it for everyone else, not for me. It's like everybody else's problem. Yeah. I don't, I don't but if to you do said to a seller, <laughs> 
is there a skill, a sales skill you'd like to get better on? Yes. Or where are the gap? Well, we need better negotiation training or we need to be told how yeah. to demo better or my reps suck at discovery or we need better ways to outbound, whatever, you know, an enabler or even sales leader is getting a laundry list 10 miles long of all the skills and knowledge based problems that could be addressed to drive business performance. So the, if done well, yeah. your enablement strategy, whatever you're bringing to these people is grounded in a business and performance goal that you have assessed enablement can solve for. And assuming you're creating great stuff, it's not like it's going to be a waste of these people's time, but there is something in the hardware and the minds of these people that doesn't exist in other realms of their life that just makes them almost averse to the idea of yeah. having to do this training or taking this test this is, or yeah. watching this video, which again, there's a sales guy I know who's learning to play the guitar and he spends, and especially during COVID with all this virtual stuff, he spent X amount of time on YouTube. He got right. a subscription, a master class, yeah. taking lessons, oh, yeah, yeah. learning to play yeah. the guitar. I cannot yeah. remember and, the and last it's time. hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, right? Learning, developing he does it in the mornings and the evenings. Yeah, the during work, during breaks, work, really. practicing. Yeah. yeah. I have a question, Dan. You've been in this game a while. When's the last time you saw a salesperson doing that with all the kick-ass sales training available to them in the they, world? This 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 is my this is my big like frustration, right? Is and you said it at the start. People want to be world class in selling, and you know they enter the world and they're like, oh, "I'm going to be the best salesperson. I'm going to hit every single target." And then it's like, "How hard are you going to work?" It's like, "Whoa, what? I'm just going to send a whole." And I think is you've seen corporate bro, like he's hilarious. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Videos. Just, I'm just going to hit this this button, like resend, 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 and that's going to do everything for me. It's that that kind of idea, and people don't do the training. Like I I've, I've played sport for my entire life. I'm current. I'm told this, but. I'm trying to be a body. I'm trying to be a bodybuilder. I am a bodybuilder. I haven't competed yet, nearly. But I'm having to work at that. If I'm going to be the best, if I'm going to be the best version of myself, you know what? I wake up at five thirty every morning. I'm in the gym at six for like an hour and a bit before the whole world is awake, right? And I have to do that, not knowing if anything is going to happen. And this is what you know sales want, right? Is you know I want to be the best negotiator. Okay, great. You know, do you have twenty, twenty-five years of experience studying? You're going to put all of that into it? No. Um, just give me one page and uh, I want to learn it in that one page. Just like that's all I'm prepared to invest. And if it takes longer than that, I'm not interested. Like, or the manager's going to say it's going to take too long. And so it's that, right? Is if you truly want to be world-class, you've got to put in what the world-class do. And if you want to be average, then accept it, but don't try and reconcile the both. You can't have Well, this both. is the, the funny thing. So, you know, I think anyone who does, uh, so you're a bodybuilder. I am not a bodybuilder. But I think sports and the arts, which is my background, have a lot in common, that whether you want to run yeah. a marathon or dance ballet, you know, perform on Broadway or lift some weights, right? Yeah. You spend more time training than performing. So even if you yes. look at a soccer or 100%. football team, of those people's 365 days, of those five 125,600 minutes, how much time do those people spend practicing, training, drilling, getting coached, yeah. yep. taking care of themselves, nailing exactly. the basics, right? Versus playing an actual match. And if yeah. you- And you and you mentioned it there, it's the fundamentals, right? The fundamentals are so much more important. Like if you, if you look at all, and I've been listening to quite a bit of stuff about Kobe Bryant over Christmas and stuff like that, Kobe would just shoot like hundreds and hundreds of shots, just super basic. He wouldn't be trying to do the 360 super mega dunks and all those kind of things. He'd be focusing on the basics. And that's, again, you know, if we look at sales, it's like, just give me the, the highlights. Just give me the highlights. Yeah, but, just no, give it you, to you me. But I think that the, the earlier philosophical, and look, who, if someone could say, I could teach you the same guitar or get you to run a marathon in half the time, we're interested. Yeah. I think dieting is a really right. good example of that. Like, you know, shortcut ways to get to the same outcome. So you could still eat cookies and lose weight or there's no counting, you know, so everyone's looking for shortcuts in life. I mean, 
you and I live in different parts of this country. Thanks to this whizzy tech thing we're using to see each other, we probably saved a day's worth of travel to sit in a studio together and have this conversation. So I'm not saying shortcuts yeah. are bad. And I think in today's universe of technology and instant gratification, we've come more and more to expect it and time is money and there's productivity expectations. So again, the paradox is, is we know this stuff is real. Let's just put that on a shelf and acknowledge the reality. However, it's the, the, the thing that I think makes this paradoxical, which enablement cannot control, but sales leaders can, which is looking at training of any kind as quote, time away from selling. Like, I don't yeah, know exactly. if, so let me ask you a question, Dan, who is the England f soccer team coach? Who's the England football coach right now? I'm going to go Gareth Southgate. That was a, hopefully. Okay. So I'm let's say, sure. is, that a, that is that a real, I don't know anything about <laughs> soccer. Is that a real person? Yeah. Was Gareth. Yeah, a real person. Okay. So if you said to Gareth Southgate or whoever might be the England coach by the time this airs, you know, when you have your guys drivel up and down the field or run in and out of those cones or do sit-ups or just take three-point shots or whatever, do you consider that time away from playing? <laughs> exactly. It's like you've got, you've got a 90-minute game coming up. It's the biggest game. And is there stuff that you'd rather them doing other than practicing and doing drills up to get ready well, for that? Well, I think the analogy there like is, that. okay, you got this big game coming up. So you got, so yeah. it would almost be like, you know what, Dan, you got this big game coming up against Brazil. So you have two options. You could either spend the time before that game, you know, doing knee, high knee kicks and, you know, laps and dribbling exercises and agility exercises, or you could go play a big game against America because I want you playing more games. I want more, you know, uh, yeah. a favorite term our, our American sales leader <laughs> says at bats. You got to get more at bats. Yes. But the funny thing is just to play through the uh, sport I know anything about, which is baseball because I grew up in New York. Players spend less time at bat than they do practicing their swings. No player yeah, would get to exactly. the bat to get to the base to hit a ball. If you actually look at a baseball game, and if you've never seen a baseball game, just Google the footage now. Before that at bat, the player is something called on deck. And what they do mm. for the entirety of what goes on for the player, two players before them, they stand on the side and practice swing after swing after swing. There's probably a 50 to one ratio of swings that they practice versus actual at yep. bats where they only get three tries, right? And then you're out. That yeah. the, the number of at bats is not, it's not about the number of at bats. It's ensuring that for whatever number of at bats you got, your swing is perfection because you, because I guarantee the pitcher throwing the ball at you from the other side, just spend a hell of a lot of time practicing their throw. So the idea, the yep. mindset that time spent learning or practicing, listening to this podcast, doing a pitch practice, objection handling, you know, back and forth, whatever is quote, time away from selling is absurd because how do you expect these people to sell without being on deck, without the practice, yeah. without employing the Am same technique that, that artists and athletes and the best performing humans on this earth employ. And yet in sales, it's like, no, go talk to a customer. Yeah. And let me come back to that on deck. I'm not a mass, uh, all the other American sports are, I'm good with, but baseball is, is my weaker one but there's a quote right which is we don't rise to the level of our expectations we fall to the level of our training like i heard this mm -hmm. I, I love this one is, is we it always like an enablement we peter the, principle into, <laughs> like the peter principle for enablers that so, yeah, fall to the level of your training i think it's some sales trainer came up with that and they just posted it on some kind of ancient manuscript but this is the idea right is we think we're up here but actually when the pressure hits we're going to fall to the level of our training and 
you know, the training is, is where the muscles are, are developed, the skill is developed, because skill is a repetitive element, right? And it allows you to deal with the scenarios. But even when I'm on deck, right? is it on deck or at deck? Or something on like deck. That? I can't remember. On deck is something. I know. I feel like. Oh, it's on deck. Okay, I thought I was on a boat then or something like that. No, I, I, I can see the <laughs> nautical, you... I can see the nautical similes. And look, you might, if you have, and I'll, I mean, I, I've never actually played baseball. I did theater though, and I will tell you what, we would rehearse for eight weeks before our first performance. Yeah. And then between exactly. performances, yeah. you rehearse. So there's at least like a yeah. hundred to one ratio between the number of hours you spend rehearsing versus the number of hours you spend performing. And what's different about certainly yeah. a play or, you know, a musical concert versus sports or versus a sale is that you are doing the same thing over and over again. Now there's always unpredictabilities all, you know, I've been in yeah. a play once where the actor forgot his lines, the set fell down, you know, there's always the unexpected that you need to be agile towards, but in doing it over and over the same lines, the same steps, the same music, you are in fact practicing every time you do it. So if you talk to any yeah. actor, you know, think about film actors, they do take after take after take because every take they do while it's supposed to be identical, they're getting better at doing that, even though they just had yeah, three months of rehearsal before right. the camera turned yeah. on. So in sales, exactly. every customer interaction is different. So you might have the same sales pitch. Every at bat you have, every customer pitch you have, you're practicing the pitch. However, since every customer response is really different, <laughs> you're having to improvise each and every time. So the more practice you yeah. do or you think, well, what could an objection be to this? Today's guy is about price. Tomorrow's guy is about the competition. Am I ready for those? Do I have enough practice swings? So whatever comes at me, the unpredictability of the person across the table from you is not the first time I am practicing saying this out loud. Or great, I got this exactly. tip sheet from enablement or from marketing with some talking points about how to counter our price increase or why we're better than the competition. Great. Now you know what to say. So you're not just making stuff up, but how much have you invested in practicing that? So the, the sales paradox here is the sales leader is like, we're losing to the competition. You come up with a whole plan about competitive selling and they're like, well, they don't have time to like do all this stuff. So can you just give them a tip sheet about what to say if they mention X company, the customer mentions X company. Yeah. So you do that. So they're not, as you say, just absolutely just standing there with their mouth on the floor or just making things out of thin air. Okay, great. So now they have fact and not fiction. But is that enough to win that game, to score that goal, to hit a home run, that at bat, unless they've practiced that and had an opportunity to be bad at it, to then be yeah. good at it, you're, you're pushing them at bat without giving them time to warm up. And the time to warm up yeah. is as much a part of the game as standing on the base. And frankly, wouldn't you want yeah. the first time someone <clears throat> does something, which is usually going to be the worst time they do it, to be in a safe environment behind closed doors where they can get coaching and feedback than sitting in front of your most important customer. So the sales paradox is rooted in the idea that it's time in invested versus time spent. They cannot spend yeah. time away from selling. No, you're investing time in their selling. This is part of selling. And I think if we eradicated that manager mindset of like this trade-off between I'm talking to customers or I'm doing your training, the paradox is going to go round and round. Yeah. And I think one, and let's talk about 70, 20, 10 in a minute as well, because I think this is one of the problems, right? And you got me on the English football team because actually my sport isn't football. It's American football. I played American football as my background years and years and years. Um, and we have this idea of a perfect play, right? Perfect play in training is even before you go up against the defense, 11 people on the field, can you run this play perfectly against air, right? And it's, you know, you'd run it, you do the thing, I'd play quarterback, I'd give the ball to a running back, they go through there, stop. Like, and if you had a coach like mine, it wasn't stop, it was like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> say that out loud. But it's like, no, you need to be here, you need to be here, you need to do this differently. Stop, go again. 
Yes. Right. Stop. Go again. Stop. Go again. And you'd run the same scenario like 10, 15, in, 20 in times until you got it right in, until in it was acting, automatic. It's the same. It's the same thing. The director yeah. will say cut or stop. No, run that line again. No, walk yeah. from here to here again. Yeah. And they're not yeah. co they're not being like, so Dan, what do you think that could have been better? They're like, no that you did something weird with your hands there, say it again. No, your hair looked yeah. weird here, do it again. Like, and you as a player, whether you're a theatrical player or a sport player, you are a player in the game. You are going to listen to that coaching and invest in that advice because you will trust that if you need this to be the best it can be, this is what you need to do. Yeah. You're not going to, Dan, did you ever stop and say, "Ugh, do I really have to do this again? Or were you just like, so yeah, many times. yeah. <laughs> but did you see the but value in better. doing it? I, it made, and, yeah. And I, I it turned out to be distinctly average at American football. <laughs> Sli <laughs> slightly well, we better than average. Cannot, but thing, we we yeah. can't take responsibility for the overall quality of the salesperson. <laughs> These are, you know, your athleticism is really on you, but yeah, exactly. I oh, know. I was, well, I was always limited. <laughs> but this is the thing, right? And so and there's, a, there's, a, there's a continuum, and this is a continuum, right? You, the continuum is from theoretical in classroom, so 10%. Like if you look at the 70 20 10 model of learning and development, 70 20 10, 10 is the classroom stuff. That's the base. You need to have a, a certain level of information and knowledge before you can get into it. Whereas sales managers and sales leaders say, you know, more time at bat or more time in sales meetings is that being the only opportunity to learn. And you got to think of it as a continuum. I used to, when I used to train new hire kind of uh, consultants back in the day, I used to want to call it live fire. I wanted them to get to live fire as quick as possible because I knew that would really develop them. But you can create scenarios in between that challenge the heck out of people, right? Completely. And that's, that's, what, that's what we're talking about, right? We're talking about coaching as, as a learning, you know, scenarios as a learning opportunity to develop skill. And, and that not being separate to selling, that's that's even more valuable well, it so that when you do get to the meetings, you're prepared. Yeah. It's kind of like, okay, so one can, it, it would kind of be like saying about preparing dinner. So if you're going to cook a dinner, it would be like, okay, I'm going to saute this stuff. I'm going to put it in a pan and cook it. Is that all, is that cooking? What about selecting the menu, yeah. buying the food, yeah. chopping the vegetables, yeah. selecting the sauces, get everything prepared, lighting the stove, right? So before you go through even the act of what you would call cooking, which is the effect of heat on food that changes its taste and texture, right? Like you wouldn't say, oh, well, it's time away from cooking because I'm chopping vegetables yeah. you can't you yeah. know what i mean it's not it, it is you can't you know, separate them too selling is part what we would call in the theater front of house and part back of house yeah so it's yes. as much putting on that production as the prop guy getting you know the sword in the right place on the stage or that set being moved into place or the orchestra coming down and sitting as it is the actors walking on stage and doing that thing. You know, the, the moment of truth with the customer is the tip of the iceberg of everything that constitutes a sale. So if you think about uh, like a sales funnel, everyone gets that when it comes to marketing, right? We need to get our brand out. We need to get qualified leads coming. You know, you usually have salespeople saying we need more MQLs, we need more leads through the funnel. We actually need more of that pre-sales activity to drive sales. Enablement yeah. and training and honing your craft is more is part of your pre. It's not even pre-sales activity. It's pre-moment of truth activity, much like an athlete yes. or a performer of any kind. Like, would you give a speech, Dan, if you hadn't written it? practiced it, maybe did it for someone, right? You're not going to go and give a keynote, you know? So how many more times would you have done that speech before going out and giving a yeah. keynote? Is it no different to us saying, Hey guys, guess what? There's a new pitch deck. So not only do we encourage you to practice, we'd like to actually see how well you do so that a, we can have a level of certainty as a business that you can articulate our value proposition, but secondly, a chance to offer you that coaching feedback, you know, in theater, we call it notes, you know, what, you know, 
to yeah. do the play again, yeah. or this section was a little bit wobbly. And instead of salespeople going, yeah. which I would hope would be the case, it, which is two sentiments, which is, thank you. I'm super excited. I, I, I have the opportunity to have this coaching. Like how lucky is any football player that gets to work with Gareth Southgate, right? Like, thank you business for helping me. Exactly. And second yeah. should be like, I am so glad the first time I am doing this or the time I am doing this poorly is not in front of that customer. People just go, ugh, I see, you know, um, let me watch this recording on 2X the speed and just, you know, submit my pitch, yeah. tick the box, whatever, because they look at it the way we look at, you know, perhaps training that we have to do as corporate citizens that maybe we have to do but don't want to do. But that's a bad mindset of any training. So, Dan, I'll give you a quick example. I'm not a techie. And every year we have to do IT training. And a oh, lot yeah. of that is, you know, how yeah, do you identify spam and yeah. phishing, right? And if I'm like, ugh, you know, I'm getting those things like, Andrea, your training's overdue. And, you know, and I know I have to do it. I'm getting nudged at doing it. I am probably watching it on 2x the speed. You take the quiz until you pass. Everyone's game in the system. But if I zoom out, if I really think about it, do I really want to get scammed? Do you know there's some pretty clever bots and stuff out there? Like, why would I not want to know enough to protect myself? So Don't all of us have yes this no, mindset. Here's, here's the thing. Now, nah, here's here's the thing. Here's the difference. And this is, I'm gonna I'm gonna argue for training on on our side of the fence. Here is is at that point that's knowledge, right? Knowledge. I know. Like, and this is the problem is that every year they send out the same training and you just have to tick the box. That's the difference, right? It's the same freaking scenario, same questions. I'm like, bup, 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 bup. I'm just going to go through it. Sorry, compliance training people, but it's true, right? And yeah, maybe there's a delta, like a tiny little new scam thing. And I did fall for a Starbucks, sent me a free Starbucks voucher last year. <laughs> ah, I really wanted my coffee, right? So there was one, um, but that's knowledge. And I still have that knowledge a year later. Was with training, with skill, and we're talking about sales. Sales is a skill. You know, and if it isn't increasing knowledge like a new deck, that's fine. But we're trying. We're talking about skill development. We're talking about taking someone from beginner to average to excellent to world class. And it is a curve, right? It is a curve. Is there's an attitude? There's an attitude element in there that you know training can add value. But let me ask you a question: Do you think it's on the sales side, or do you think it's on the training side? So is it a sales mindset where I'm like. Uh, because, um, you know, I don't want to challenge myself. I don't want to learn. Or is it on the training side where the training is too often generic and weak and actually not providing that level of challenge? It's... Or third one, I'll just throw another one in. Is it the level of coaching that you get? Because, again, I, you know, we submit these things and people go, yep, good enough. I don't actually learn from going through the process. Like, what, what's your thoughts? It's kind of a combination of the three. I think if a sales manager needs to see a sales rep do something and you're like this mandatory training on our new narrative or this product is due by X and we expect hundred percent certification, guess what happens? You, if, if, you know, if the CRO yells at people enough, it gets done. Yeah. And everyone yeah. just cruises through it. You know, the reps submit their recording after watching the video on 2x the speed and the manager watches that recording on 2x the speed and is like, yeah, it's fine, whatever. So there needs to start with a belief that the training you're getting is bringing you value. But then the quid pro yeah. quo, kind of a separate paradox, is the stuff the trainers bring needs to not suck. It needs to actually bring yeah. that value. So I kind of feel like what's, you know, span of control versus span of influence. I could work with my team to be like, gang, our training needs to be far better, right? There's vendors out, there's people, you know, there's, there's people selling, you know, it, it's kind of like old witch doctor medicine, like, you know, take my five-step approach to discovery and smash meetings every, you know, it's okay, fine. Like, as yeah. I said, people are looking for shortcuts everywhere and, and salespeople are no different. And there's a lot of shystery solutions out there that people are looking for and saying, well, I need this framework or I need this template or I need this way. 
when sometimes good old fashioned, let's just get in a room and practice doing this well with feedback. No, nope, do this again. Nope. You, you flub that, you know, the, the way that athletes and yeah. actors and, you know, anybody trying to learn anything, you know, I guarantee that sales guy who's practicing the guitar is doing exactly the same thing for that personal driver if you're motivated enough. So yeah. I think it does come back to seller motivation in the first place, because otherwise, mm. and especially on Zoom, you're just going to sit there, cruise through it, get into a breakout room dick around and be like, okay, we got through this or I'm emailing the whole time or whatever, yeah. because for some reason you don't believe yeah. that this is important and indeed part of your job, the way an athlete yeah. who everyone admires, you're reading stuff by Kobe or Ronaldo or whomever, all they ever talk about is how important their practice and skills and coaching are. Because if you're not strong and you're not agile and you don't have coaching on the best plays based on possible scenarios that the opposing team might have. What if a customer said this, what happens when that happens? Well, then you're just on the field being like, well, I don't know what to do here. I hope this is right. Is, you know, and talk about that's, that's just you imagine you, you know, you're in a team, you're in a team sale, you and your CSM are sitting next to each other being like, well, I don't, what do we do? You know, we hear horror yeah. stories about I thought that. You did this bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you learn a lot. So to your point about so, 70, 20, 10, yeah. yes, huge learning happens there, but wouldn't but it be learn nice? That before, you... right? Let's not learn it when you're getting paid to learn it. Like, oh, potentially like you've got the biggest deal that could go ahead and now you're figuring stuff out. Come on. Exactly. So, yeah. I mean, yes, I will tell you what, when you fail in front of people and I have done it a lot, look, I did stand up comedy in New York for years. You, nothing is more soul depleting than standing in front of a room of people and them just like staring back at you, yeah. <laughs> like, not laughing, yeah. not even reacting. You know, you would practice those jokes. Let's just say at some small club, no one ever heard of to see like, was this any good? Was this funny? Yeah. That joke was too long. I need to tweak yeah. that before you're going to get on your Netflix special, aren't you? So before you're going to learn, that's what comedians do. They go yeah. through, yeah, they go through the little warm up. No, so, I've, you know, I've been there. They, they've got their notes. They're literally exactly. reading from a script. Exactly. Right? I'll try this one out. It didn't work. I emphasize here. Yeah. And what, what do I need to do to tweak it? But yes, of course, if yeah. the controlled environment and the scenarios we're creating suck, people give it a chance and then be like, this sucked. And I think a lot of the sales mindset comes from people who have had sucky training at that company or in yeah. their careers before, which is why new hires are always such a joy because they're such a captive audience. They're like, great, teach me things. I, I'm, I'm here to learn how to sell this stuff here. And like within the first day, if that's not meeting the mark, they're just like, right, I'm a bail on these sessions and ask the guy who sits next to me how to do all these things. Like we have a duty of care to produce quality work or at least work that doesn't suck. However, yeah, you know, I would say that we are also old school in how we're doing that. So here's a like a, a couple of things I've done that have worked. So first of all, try to create not just the conversation, but the emotional environment that someone finds themselves in. So for instance, new hires take their certification really seriously because they don't know people very well here. So even if it's their manager, they're like, shit, yeah. I need to make a good impression on this person, just like you would a customer. Now, if I've worked with my manager for five years and I know them and they know me and I know they're going to want me to like get through whatever mandatory crap this is, or the manager has said, look, guys, just submit it. I will just tick the box. You don't know what goes on behind closed doors. You can do all the role plays you want, but that feels different than in a customer environment. So how do you switch it up? couple ways. Number one, if you're going to certify someone on anything, have a manager that doesn't report to them, certify them. Oh, like that. So Great even idea. though it's a safe space, you still have the anxiety of interfacing with someone, A, you don't know very well, and B, they're crafting a judgment on you. So then, yeah. you know, Dan, like you that. certify one of my guys, and then I'm going to see your comment on that guy's like, there's a lot of skin in the game here all around. So I'm going to want to make sure like yeah. Dan doesn't think my team are full of losers. And that 
person is not going to want Dan to tell me that they suck. So that's an very I've got easy... a certification that we're planning today. Like I'm changing it up today. That's it's it's be, an easy that's, way. That's so you're doing cold calling yeah. training. Guess what? Have your CEO or CRO mystery dial into a couple people. I guarantee that will change the game. So if that person can't dedicate half yeah. an hour to being part of that, just say, hey, you know what? When you have two seconds, blah, 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 there's five reps, call them. Amazing. I mean, you will Amazing. be on your game. Yeah. You know, so you sometimes do need to, you want to create the safety, but enough anxiety that people say, I got to do this well. You know, have your CRO yeah. or CMO or whoever the, you know, if you're, you're pitching tech, have your CTO come for that final pitch off and give feedback yeah. and be like, as a tech guy, say, it's, it's not, it's an audition for the rest of your career. Like, exactly. hey, this is who I am. And, and know, again, it's about you as enablers like getting those stakeholders to see the vitality and the importance. But I will tell you what, at Showpad, if I said to our CTO or chief product officer or chief marketing officer, our reps are working on talking to people like you better. Mm. Can you come yeah, for come, half an hour and listen to these pitches like or give them those yeah. feedbacks? They'd be delighted because it's in everyone's best interest for our sales team to be amazing. But giving someone yep. a tip sheet is great if just needing a few tips closes that delta between the gap and the result. But from a skills perspective, yeah. from a coaching perspective, there's cool stuff we can do, but again, if everyone's just going to cruise through it, and especially now in the digital universe in which we find ourselves, we can't really control the room literally the way we used to be able to. It does take more self-initiative, I would say, from the sales community to see why this is important. I guarantee you, yeah. like the England football team during COVID couldn't all get together and practice, so you had to trust that insert name of football player here yeah. was doing their drills in their backyard. Yeah. And I just started watching man in the arena on Disney, okay. um, which is about the, the, the Patriots, the Tom, Tom Brady and the, and the new England Patriots. And they have what they call the edge. Right. And they, there was a, a group of leaders within the team who said, I'm always going to do a little bit more than you. I'm always going to challenge you a little bit more. And you know, Oh, you're leaving earlier already. Like, you know, oh, I'm just going to stay in the gym for another half an hour. Or I'm going to do this. And it's pushing, pushing that, that kind of level. And whether that's on activity, like driving the activity in terms of quality, whether it's upskilling, you need leaders within your organization. This is why culture is so important. You need leaders to set that expectation. And, and you know, if, if leaders are letting people off the hook by not grading, by not providing good feedback, you know, that, that's a challenge, right? And yes, we're all busy and things like that. So I think there's two elements that, yeah, I like it. Sales training, don't suck, right? Create stuff that's good. Salespeople realize that world class comes at a cost. <laughs> yeah. And if you truly want to be world class, then put in the effort and, and get there. And don't think that average effort is going to get you anywhere near it because it's not going to continue to put in time. Dan, if we can get to a world where people stop thinking of it as cost and start thinking of it as an investment, with the more they put in, the greater the return. Now, I think that would be the game changer because it's not a trade-off. Yeah. It is part of what your job involves. So yeah. baseball players, they have that bats and they have practice swings. And in the 525,600 minutes in that year, they create the right ratio for themselves. And in a baseball game, which is a bit more like sales, I think, than football, because every football player on the field is always on, similar to being in front of customers, yeah. you get your chance, then you don't get a chance for a while. And yeah. then you have to wait for your turn to come around again. And then you have that brief chance. Um, um, exactly. And this is what I like about the, about the just on deck thing is, and if you watch them, they'll either swing two bats or there'll be a bat with a weight on it. And this is the, this is the yes. thing, right? It's because yes. when you get into that moment, when you get into that moment, 
that moment needs to be easy. It needs to be automatic. It needs to be like not raising to expectation, falling to training. And so by doing things that make you stronger in that moment, yes, it's a drill. It's not a real game. We get it. It's a drill. It's a practice session. Yes. But we're making it harder. So when you get into that moment, you're like, you're like this oh, was easy. Oh. Yeah. My customer didn't exactly. have nearly those kind of objections. It's funny. I I know, right? I always get going to do with two objections, not the twenty that we did in training. Exactly. Or <laughs> like onboarding. Like people say, oh, an onboarding or a product certification. You know, we want to go easy on these people. They haven't done it. I'm like, no. We want to have like when I instruct managers to do those new hire role plays. I'm like, you yeah. have to play the worst customer for your segment or your market. Yeah. Be the exactly. worst customer ever and then people are like no but these are newbies i'm like you know what so when they meet their real customer they're like i got th- i couldn't agree more so it's like yeah. again like you you run more miles training for a marathon than you do an actual marathon you know it's so yeah. again like it's a mindset thing I wish I had people coming to me saying we need more practice can we run more practice sessions can you help you know, people just want, can you bring us a new framework or can you give us a, t- you know, can you give us stuff to short circuit the work? People want yeah. a quicker way to the same outcome. And back to the sales paradox of a sales leader saying, well, I want to achieve all these millions of things and I want to do it in five minutes. The advice I'd have to enablers yeah. dealing with a sales paradox is this. Your sales people have to deal with this all the time. It is exactly the same as a customer saying, I want the full solution. I want all five things you proposed to me, but I want to pay half the price you said. (laughs) Would a sales leader approve that deal? Probably not. When they're under budget, but (laughs) maybe they're like, oh, please just buy anything. (laughs) But you know, but that's desperate, right? Then you, that's not standing by your value. And we can't live like that. You can't live yeah. like that. Your business won't be sustainable, right? So it'd be yeah. like a supermarket being like, you could buy eight gallons of milk for the price of one. It's fine for a promotion, but as an ongoing thing, they're going to be out of stock. No, yeah, the right exactly. sales, a, sale, a good salesperson would turn around and say, okay, we have one of two things. Either your budget is constrained, in which case we are going to need to say what of, you know, of the five things we put to you, what are the two and a half that matter most? And we will, for your money, give you, prioritize those things that you need more than others. Or you are really committed to solving all these problems, in which case that's the price. Yeah. I love that. And as enablers, it's the same thing. They want to transform the way their reps build customer relationships and, you know, leading with customer problems and a solution-based sale. Well, guess what? That is not going to be solved in a 10-minute e-learning and a two-page tip sheet. So if that's all that leader can commit to, if they don't, if that's all the collateral they have to put up for that investment, or if they're still looking at it as a cost, you got to be really clear to them what that tip sheet and 30 minute video are going to solve for because what ends up happening, and this is us creating our own paradox. Maybe it's called the enablement paradox is that in the, in the desperation for us to be seen to be customer centric and adding value and delivering to the business and not asking them for too much in return, we're like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to focus more on leading with customer problems. So great. I'll do that 30 minute video and here's your tip sheet. And guess what? Those things do not solve the problem. And then Correct. the next thing you come out with, they're going to look at and say, well, your enablement sucks because you don't solve any of our problems. Well, guess what? Yeah. Much like why customers churn in sales, this is why salespeople get switched off to training. Not because it sucks. It's just because it's insufficient to solve their problem. So it is up to yeah. us, I think, to negotiate with them as well as they negotiate with their customers and to certain sales leaders, I have used that same technique and say, well, would you do this to a customer? Like I can't solve all your problems in an hour. I could solve one problem in an hour. Name your problem. Well, I don't want to pick one. All right. Well then I need five hours. Yeah. So, and I love that. And I don't think enablers and trainers are 
that strong in a, in an effort to people please i think we'll just say yes and and kind of do but ironically what we can we are and, then, and like I say the needles don't move yeah but then we're creating like a toilet flush of our own destiny which is a twofold failure <laughs> they don't improve yep. and then they think we suck <laughs> Yeah. So clear yeah, exactly. Like, and then you've got to dig yourself out of the hole by digging. <laughs> exactly. While you were trying to be super customer centric by saying yes. So yeah. I think it's, it, it is, if they're seeing it as a cost, talk their language, the cut, you know, the customer, whatever product or service your company is selling, your customers and prospects are considering the cost versus outcome. What will a hundred grand yeah. get me? What will 10 grand get me in our world? What will half an hour of my people's time off the field get me? That's like, you know, a baseball player being like, well, what if I only was on deck and doing practice swings? If I'm up at the game, if I have three at bats in a given baseball game, what if I only did my practice swings for 30 seconds before one of them? And the answer would probably be it's like, great. you wouldn't, you wouldn't do it. Uh, that would never be happen. a question in that person's mind. Yeah. But if exactly. it was, then exactly. the coach would probably turn around and, you know, let me ask you, Dan, you're, you're, you're into bodybuilding at the moment. If, if I said to you, so Dan, what would happen if you only, you want to be a great bodybuilder and you want to be world-class and you've got a young family, you're doing this podcast, you have a day job, you're a busy guy. So every minute you spend at the gym is an investment in that goal. So Dan, let me ask you a question. Yep. What if you only went to the gym once a week? I just can't do it. I'd, I'd have to lower my expectation. Like, and I'd have to accept that that's just not going to happen. And Dan, so, what if I told yeah. you that and it's I crazy, want... crazy, right? In every other context. Exactly. And if I turned to you and said, well, Dan, I still want you to be at that same level of fitness, but I only want you going to the gym once a week. How would you respond to that? There's only so much pre-workout I can take. <laughs> I could take a lot, but I so definitely can't. I can't do it in that time, right? I just cannot. This is exactly. So um, that's what you're raising a good point. You know, it's like I want to retire at 45, but I only want to save five dollars a month. Like it's you know, I want great teeth, but I only want to brush them. You know, every other day, like every other aspect of our life, you'd see that same logic and think that's crazy. So if we as enablers value yeah. what we do, if we believe that we create stuff that helps people, then why are we consistently undervaluing it and somehow making it think like witch doctor -y, magic potions out there that somehow you don't have to put in a lot to get a lot back. And we want to make things efficient, a good use of people's time. This podcast is 45 minutes. Could it have been 20 minutes? Maybe. Or maybe not. So. Exactly. It is on double speed. There you go. Exactly. The, 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 the pre-workout equivalent <laughs> of, <your> <laughs> of audiobooks. <laughs> so, Andrea, I think this is, this is awesome. And, you know, I, I've taken ideas away. And thank you so much for sharing. So I think the lessons from this are if you're in sales training and enablement, make good stuff. Yeah, make it. And, and you know, don't be afraid. Like what it used to take three days, get it down to a day or whatever it is. Consolidate. There's never anything wrong with that. But recognize the value that you can add. Recognize what it's going to take to get there and then hold your guns. Right. And, you know, if you're given less time, then deliver promise less and deliver what you need to. Sales leaders see training as part of the sales process. I like that. It's not separate to as part of and see it as an investment of your seller's time not an expense of your seller's time. And if you are a salesperson and you want to be world-class, then do what it takes to get world-class. Yeah, do the reps, do the preparation, do the things around the game that make you world-class. Andrea, this was phenomenal. So like many what? ideas, so many great pieces of contact and shifting the mindset of people towards development. You know, we need this in the industry. Um, just a real quick reminder, how can people find you? Where, where are you hiding these days? Where am I hiding? Well, in my home office, like everybody else still for some reason, but um, I can be found on LinkedIn, Andrea Abate, two Bs, one T. Um, always happy to connect, have a dialogue, hear what's working or not working for other enablers or salespeople, um, and of course on Showpad. So thanks for, thank you for having me, Dan, and um, for the really interesting dialogue. And, you know, let's just commit today on this call that like, 
you know, we'll lead with value. We'll, we'll lead with what we want to see back, which is let's just make sure that everything we put out there doesn't suck. If we build it, they will exactly. come. <laughs> Another baseball analogy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kevin Costner, I'm going to leave you there. Uh, it's been fun. Had a great time. And uh, yeah, I'll see you again soon. Thanks, Dan. You know what I think, Ron? I think that was a sales call. Good job, buddy. So you're going to buy a subscription? No, I already get the times. Bye-bye. <laughs>